Welcome everybody. We'll be starting our event in a few short minutes. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this event marking the release of the first set of products from the Council on Criminal Justice's Task Force on Policing. Before we begin our program, a few notes. We are joined today by over 300 participants, including advocates, police executives and officers, policymakers, the public, and members of the media. So to ensure a quality experience for everyone, we're muting you, um, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. So throughout today's session, you can submit questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll take as many questions as we can uh, as possible towards the very end of our panel discussion. So now let's welcome President and CEO of the Council on Criminal Justice, Adam Gelb. Thank you, Dr. Lavine. Um, you know, um, I'll just do a quick introduction here. Um, to the council and the task force. You know, the council is still a new organization or less than two years old. Um, we got two parts. We're an invitational membership organization building a center of gravity across all the sectors and disciplines and ideologies across this field. Uh, and we're a nonpartisan think tank helping to ground policy debates in facts, evidence and fundamental principles of justice. Uh, our task forces combine these two core components. Uh, convening diverse groups of top experts from across the country, basing discussions on the most recent and rigorous research, and building consensus on solutions that can advance both safety and justice. The Task Force on Policing is our third, uh, following a Task Force on Federal Priorities and our National Commission on COVID and Criminal Justice, which released its final report in December. And it comes at a moment uh, of enormous opportunity, uh, perhaps the greatest chance in a generation to shape the future of policing in America. Now we established the task force in, in November, recognizing uh, this opportunity and how important it is that the unprecedented demands for reform actually translate into the greatest possible change. And, and recognizing that lives are on the line, that people's rights and equality and dignity are on the line and that public confidence in the police, uh, in our criminal justice system and our entire democracy uh, are on the line. Uh, so that was a charge to the task force. Look at the data, look at the evidence, look to your own experience and give us your best thinking on which of the dozens of proposals for reform out there will make the biggest difference. And I think that's exactly what the task force has done uh, with this first set of issues that we'll be presenting and discussing today. Three policies that directly implicate the cases of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, for each one of these three, they've said, here are the central facts. Here's what the research tells us and what it doesn't. Uh, uh, and they've done it in a way I think that really wrestles with the details and the trade-offs uh, doesn't pretend this is all easy and doesn't come with serious upsides and downsides and potential unintended uh, side effects and consequences. You know, what, so what we essentially have here are buyer's guides that say, if you're a mayor or a chief or a governor or a city or state legislator, here's what you need to know. Uh, so I, I just want to commend and thank the members of the task force for dedicating their time and expertise and experience to the effort. It's been our honor to convene such a distinguished and diverse group of leaders, and we appreciate our panelists today and their willingness to give you a window into their deliberations and collaboration. I also want to thank 
Our partners at the University of Chicago Crime Lab at the Harris School of Public Policy on the direction of Dr. Jens Ludwig. Uh, the Crime Lab is providing crucial research support to this work. Uh, also, we'd like to acknowledge our funders and diversity of the funders of the task force uh, is reflected here as well. Uh, Ken Griffin, the founder and CEO of Citadel, the Joyce Foundation, Microsoft, Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, and the National Football League, uh, as well as the council's general operating supporters. Uh, so we're, we are so fortunate to have Dr. Nancy Lavigne uh, directing the task force. She's an expert in policing and, and, and many other uh, issues across criminal justice. And I think she and the, the team here at CCJ uh, have just done an amazing job processing a tremendous amount of information and facilitating these first, uh, these first meetings and assembling this all into a, um, a really strong set of first products. So Nancy, with that, over to you. Thanks so much, Adam. So you see up on the screen, our task force members, I wish I could lift each and every one of them up because they're amazing people and it's a great collective. We're so lucky to have three of them here today. Mr. DeRay McKesson is co-founder of Campaign Zero. He's been a fierce advocate for common sense policies to reduce excessive and racially biased police use of force and killings of members of the public. He's a strong advocate for data and for transparency. And he and his team have contributed substantially to the field's knowledge on the lay of the land and what police reforms are being adopted by what jurisdictions and states across the country. We also have Sheriff Rosie Rivera, who actually wears two hats. She's Sheriff of Salt Lake County in Utah. She's also CEO of the Greater Salt Lake Unified Police Department. So these two roles give her a really unique perspective that she brings to the task force understanding a lot of aspects of the criminal justice system from enforcement to local incarceration. She's passionate about finding alternatives to incarceration. She's advocated for victims and survivors of domestic violence throughout her career. And she remains actively involved in mentoring gang involved youth. We also have Ms. Tashante McCoy Ham, who is regional manor, manager and founder of Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice and the OWL movement. She hails from Stockton, California. Sadly, she's experienced the loss firsthand of friends and family members to both community violence and police violence. And her work focuses on trauma-informed healing, restorative justice, and reconciliation processes. Welcome to all of you. So today marks the first release of the first set of assessments from the task force. And we examined the three policies, banning chokeholds, requiring officers to intervene when witnessing misconduct by fellow officers and prohibiting no-knock warrants. As Adam referenced in his opening remarks, each of these policies um, required the task force to really understand the research, uh, digest the facts and wrestle with the nuance. Um, so if you see on the next, next slide, I'll just share a little bit of how they got from research to recommendations. So the task force, along with a team of researchers, both at the council and at the crime lab at the University of Chicago, um, assessed the empirical evidence. What do we know from the evaluative literature about what works, both on the specific topic um, that there, that's under study in the context of policing, as well as related applications in different fields and disciplines. Um, they also looked at the policy landscape what are agencies doing now? Which ones are adopting early? What appears to be best practice? And they uh, looked at the summary data on you know, what's happening, what do we know about the underlying problem and what is the underlying context that can help inform their recommendations. And sifting through all of that, they also applied their professional expertise and their lived experience. And importantly, the recommendations are consensus-based. And what that means is that they didn't agree on everything, <laughs> absolutely not. I mean, this is a diverse group with like lots of different perspectives and, um, and we couldn't expect that, but they did come to consensus and the definition of consensus is general agreement. And if you don't agree, you at least agree to live with it because in general, it represents uh, the collective. So that's what we have here today. And I'm, I'm super proud of the task force for wrestling with these tough issues and coming up with these consensus recommendations. So what did they come up with? Real quick, because I don't want to steal their thunder. Um, in terms of chokeholds, uh, they chose to recommend uh, banning both chokeholds and all manner of neck restraints. That includes car carotid or also known as vascular holds. Um, they understand that there's differences between these types of holds, that some are more dangerous than others, but they felt that overall the holds are, are inhumane, they're cruel, 
and they're dangerous and potentially harmful to people and they erode community trust. Um, they did note that very few people uh, have been um, documented as dying from asphyxiation uh, due to these types of holds. And so they made a point of saying that banning chokeholds and other types of holds are important, but you can't stop there. They have to be combined with other measures. Next slide, please. Duty to intervene. Um, so the task force overwhelmingly supported policies requiring officers to intervene when they see their peers or superiors engaging in excessive use of force and other unlawful behavior. And a lot of agencies have duty to in intervene policies baked into their use of force or de-escalation policies, but they felt it was very important to uh, really uh, bolster these recommendations through accountability measures. And importantly, what they learned from the literature is that recognition is almost more important. So recognizing those officers that do intervene on the spot, that that really makes a difference. They also went one step forward, which is to lift up this concept of mandatory reporting. So a duty to intervene is kind of like intervening on the spot, but what happens when officers witness uh, other types of misconduct or behaviors that suggest that their, their mental health is at risk, or maybe it's a substance addiction issue that's making its way onto the job. And that type of reporting is very important for identifying and flagging officers that may need help and could have those behaviors spill over into their interactions with the community. And finally, they learned that the research indicates that underlying biases can lead people to refrain from intervening. So addressing those is also an important component. And then finally, they tackle the topic of no-knock warrants and police rates, um, which are kind of one and the same, depending on how you look at it. Um, they recommended not just severely restricting no-knock warrants, but also something known as quick knock, wa knock warrants. That's something that's legally justified, but you, the officer only has to wait 15 to 20 seconds before entering after knocking. They felt like these practices were very dangerous to occupants and officers alike and those dangers outweighed any form of benefits. Uh, they also felt that it was important that all search warrants, no knock, with knock, short knock, doesn't matter. All of them need to be informed by very thorough threat assessments. So you know what you're walking into and making sure you're mitigating risk to everybody. And finally, they felt very strongly that agencies should routinely publish data on warrant requests, services, and outcomes. So those are the summaries, and now we will dig into the conversation. Let's um, start uh, with you, Mr. McKesson. Um, through your organization, Campaign Zero, you've been advocating for the adoption of all three of these policies. I mean, uh, some people who might be watching might say, well, what is the added value here? Um, we already know that Campaign Zero wants, wants all these policies and, and more but um, maybe you can help us sort through some of the nuance. So let's start with chokeholds. Um, as you know, the task force had a very lively debate around ba banning both chokeholds and carotid or vascular holds. And they know that the research on the latter suggests that they're not particularly lethal or harmful when they're administered by an officer who has been specialized and trained to do those types of holds. So can you share with us a little bit why the task force decided to recommend banning both? Yes, yeah, so I think when we zoom out, so much of the conversation focuses on police violence that results in death. We also know there's a whole range of police violence that doesn't result in death. So part of this work is not only to get the, the amount of people killed down to zero, but also make sure that people aren't harmed in general. And we know that the act of neck restraints or uh, stopping blood flow to someone's a brain that that happens often enough that we should actually consider this as a policy change. The other thing that we think about is that there are a lot of places that have banjo holds and not strangle holds or uh, the carotid restraint or vice versa, like they ban carotid and not ban the, the chokehold. And remember, a chokehold is uh, the uh, your windpipe, and then a strangle hold is the muscles around your neck. So when I think about why this really matters in the grand scheme, is that, and we felt this this summer when we made a big push around this in campaign zero is that there are so many people who believe that this is already the case. They're like, oh, we did it. This already happened. You're like, we didn't do it. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Like we've talked about it a lot. People have entertained it a lot, but we actually haven't done it. So we have done more of these restrictions in the past sort of 10, 12 months than we've done ever in American history. 
but there are 18,000 police departments. So even though we've probably done 400 cities have changed their policies, uh, you know, a handful of states, there's actually a lot more to go. So I'm proud that the, that the task force sort of understands that this is one of the things that can happen. We know that this alone won't be the game changer. We know that mm -hmm. this alone won't be the thing to tip the scales, but this is one of the important things that we actually need to do. Thank you for that. Sheriff Rivera, how does the recommendation of ban chokeholds and neck restraints square with policing practices on the ground? What do you think it will take to ensure that officers actually comply with such a ban? Well, I think what it's gonna take is officers will have to be held accountable if, if they don't comply with the ban. Um, and also police agencies that don't change their policies. Uh, here in Utah, uh, the chokeholds were banned uh, this yeah. last year. Uh, many of the agencies have already worked on changing their policies. And what's happening across the board is agencies that have changed their policies have offered to share those policies with uh, you know, smaller agencies that, that may not have the resources. So that, that's really important. And also, you know, I, I, I wanna comment because chokeholds and any type of neck restraints are dangerous. Uh, and if they're not properly training the officers and there's no guarantee that every single agency across the nation is doing that, uh, it, it becomes dangerous. Officers will refer back to the training that they were provided when yeah, they're in an emergency situation or a hands-on situation, they always refer back to what they've been trained. If they haven't been trained on them, they will use them inappropriately. So I think uh, uh, the majority of police chiefs across the nation agree that without the proper training, these, these holds uh, don't work. Uh, and you know we wanna save lives. So if that somebody has lost their life because of one, we have to do everything we can to make things better. And I think yeah. the ban is the way to go. It sounds like even one life is too many, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. Ms. McCoy, one thing the task force learned through its research is that asphyxiation was the cause of death for less than 1% of people who died when law enforcement were involved in any way whatsoever. That was for 2019, but the data looks similar from year to year. What we have very little data on is how many people are harmed by these types of neck restraints, but not killed. Can you share more about the community perspective on the chokehold ban policy? So for me, you know, from the community perspective, I found myself while we're going through this um, actual uh, recommendation, like thinking, why do we have to even debate about whether or not it's okay to choke a human being? You know, um, there is no safe way to choke a person and it's inhumane. And there is no data to show, as my loved one DeRay said, um, how many folks, the lasting um, result of being choked out. Um, we don't have data to show like how it, how it has affect um, folks in our community. And then I think the bigger, the bigger picture of it all is that it erodes trust. It contributes to the narrative of why community members do not trust law enforcement um, when you have the right to choke someone. It's just inhumane. Um, and so for me, this one was just like a no brainer. It was like we shouldn't even have to go back and forth about this because it's just, it just doesn't, it does, there's no safe way to do this and it's very inhumane. Thank you for that. Uh, so we all know that George died from a type of neck restraint, a rather unusual one. Um, that was applied by an officer while three of his colleagues stood by and did nothing. That episode underscored the importance of agencies considering the adoption of duty to intervene policies, something that this task force recommends. Sheriff Rivera, can you tell us how much does culture and police leadership come into play in ensuring that these types of intervention policies are adopted and complied with? I think they play a very large role. Uh, law enforcement leaders, we set the tone for the way that the organization runs. And if the organization puts fear in officers for speaking out, uh, that is not a good thing. So if you have a leader who is saying, uh, you know, in order to gain trust and responsibility, uh, we need to speak out, we need to bring it forward and also recognize those who do. 
by, you know, telling them this was a good thing that you did bring this out. Uh, we also have to increase diversity and collaborate with others and provide the, the training. Uh, that should be part of every officer's training is talking about duty to intervene, why you should report these and not allow something like that to occur. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. McCoyham, the task force also goes a step further as I referenced earlier. So it's not just duty to intervene on the spot, but it's this mandatory compo uh, reporting component that um, they felt was important. The officers should feel comfortable to kind of break that, that blue wall, that blue line of silence um, and um, share when they see other officers uh, engaging in all manner of misconduct. It could be anything that um, relates to officer wellness like drinking on the job, it could be the use of racial slurs, um, all manner of things that might signal that this person needs help or else this could spill over into the community. Um, can you share your um, insights and experiences about that? And by uh, bad company corrupts good behavior. And so therefore, um, it, it, it's almost interesting how it mirrors the same thing in the community, right? So there is an expectation on law enforcement um, from their perspective that we should share things that we know in order to prevent violence and crime, right? Well, I feel like when it comes to um, the discussion about reducing um, negative um, interactions between community and law enforcement, we always overlook um, the impacts of trauma and how trauma within um, the system um, directly affects trauma in the streets. And so if you duty to intervene, it's like it only, it makes sense to do that because then you're able to acknowledge personal issues that lead to corroded or corrupted behavior, right? So if you have this narrative and this culture that if you see something, um, you, don't, you don't speak up or you don't say anything. George Floyd is a perfect example. We literally watched them stand by and look at look at what was taking place and never once said, hey, you know, maybe we should stop. Um, direct direct um, correlation between the fact that you're not being held accountable and the adverse experiences that take place in community. And so to me, another no brainer um, to literally shift the culture and narrative of policing um, and systems as a whole to adopt a trauma informed narrative um, so that those negative, nasty behaviors that we all, you know, even in community, um, don't spill out in how we, how um, law enforcement um, serves, treats, um, and experiences high levels of implicit bias because of their own unacknowledged trauma. Mm -hmm. So I think all of that is tied to that duty to intervene. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. McKesson, would you care to jump in? Yeah, I think that I think that Shashante said it right. This is like one of the simple. This is like one of the simpler ones, right? You're like, well, this is there should be a consequence if you see something bad happening and you don't do anything. Like that feels basic. I think the hard part about this, and you know, I think about this when we did it over the summer about it, is that people think this is the case already, right? They think that there's already a duty. They think that there's already a requirement. They think there's a consequence if there isn't, and like there isn't. So in a lot of places, what we find is that like you know, there might be retaliation if people term, if people like do something or the policy will say something like, you know, officers should review and off you're like, what does it even mean to review when somebody's using excessive force wrong? Like that doesn't mean anything, right? You should have to intervene and that should actually be the policy. So I think this is a no brainer. I think this is one that we would call common sense, not commonplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very helpful. There's some nuance there that when we we kind of dug into the literature and we found some interesting things, right? So around um, why in other contexts, what, what we know about people standing by and not intervening, even looking at um, the Holocaust, for example, what is it that prevented people from stepping up and doing the right thing, even when they knew that they were witnessing something that was egregiously wrong? And one of the things we learned from the literature is that um, people who other themselves from the victims have an easier time not intervening. Uh, they justify it. Um, they're different from us. They're all bad guys. Um, we know a lot about how uh, high crime communities tend to be villainized uh, by people. They're all bad. You know, everyone's doing the crime. Um, those types of narratives can really lead officers to feel like 
uh, it's okay, it's them against us. Um, I hate to speak in these terms, but I think that that's the reality on the ground about how these things tend to unfold. Um, so I'm interested in knowing from any of you um, what you think about um, the notion of addressing culture that addresses some of these notions, these stereotypes, these biases. You talking to me? Anybody. Oh, yeah, I, you know, I'll just start and say like, you know, I struggle with the culture piece is, uh, you know, imagine if you had a job where it was impossible to get fired and it, you never got, it was just hard to get in trouble. Um, is that that to me like breeds its own culture. So I think part of this work is to say like right now, as we as we sort of think about uh, a transition away from the carceral state, away from all those things, um, like how do we make sure that in the moment that there are clear rules, that there's clear accountability, and that is the stuff that ultimately changes culture. Like I'm not convinced that like the frou-frou stuff does it. I think it is like the, it's like the hard and fast, like this is okay, this isn't okay, right? Like this is what mm -hmm. we accept, this is what mm -hmm. we don't accept. Here's what the mechanism is for right, accountability. Right. And like, I think that is actually what, that's how culture, when I think about being a teacher, I used to teach sixth grade math. It wasn't enough for me to come in and be like, hey, everybody, I hope you love math. It was like, here's the schedule. <laughs> If you know, if you don't do this, this is what happens. If you do it, this is what like that actually built a culture in a classroom. Clear, clear, transparent rules that are followed that are adhered to, right? Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on the topic of culture before we move on? I totally agree with what he said. Some stuff is just like I'm a, a huge Beyonce fan, so she has a song called "Find Your Way Back," and I feel like. A lot of it has to go back to basic core values and be in what it means to be a human being and to see one another as human beings and as one community. Um, because like you said, it's easy to separate yourself um, from the reality of what is taking place. And so basic core values and an accountability system that is transparent um, uh, based on the findings and the consistency in the fallacy of what is going on. It's, it, it's again, a no brainer to me. Yeah, and I, I want to comment for a sec too. I, I think that the culture of uh, policing can be changed. And, you know, I don't want to, people to think that all police agencies uh, uh, are not, you know, uh, following the rules because they are. I, I have fired people myself. So I, I think that it depends on the leader and who they are and how they hold people accountable. Once you start holding people accountable, it starts to change the, the message across the board and it does change a culture of an organization. Uh, and, but it does start from the top down. And you know I just don't want uh, the general public to think this is uh, law enforcement as a whole, we need to change. But we do have some good police leaders out there who are making the changes and we do provide a good service. But we also have to be able to recognize when there is a problem and, and be part of the change. Because if you're just gonna say there is no problem, that doesn't work. We have to get involved and make those changes. Thank you for that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw another question your way, Sheriff. I'm switching to the topic of no-knock warrants. Uh, the task force recommends um, both restrict, severely restricting no-knock warrants and what's known as quick-knock warrants, um, which goes, uh, I think, a significant step further than um, a lot of the, the no-knock bans that are on the books to date. And you, your, Utah, your own home state, ha banned no-knock warrants, um, specifically those for the purpose of drug possession searches in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, can you share a little bit your experience with this policy, um, how that how that had an impact? Uh, maybe it didn't, I don't know, I'm just curious to know what your experience is and how it applies to the task force recommendation. Yeah, that was enacted several years ago and, and the impact to law enforcement uh, wasn't huge uh, because the, typically you weren't serving no-knock warrants on a, a simple drug possession anyway. Uh, the role it does play, though, is that we can look at it and see that that uh, if it didn't change the way law enforcement were doing things and it didn't impact them, then it's okay to continue having that. Um, I think what this task force has also found is that 
no knock warrants are dangerous and there needs to be some type of assessment done uh, in order, to, you're putting a lot of lives on the line when you're, you're doing no knock warrants. And I, the data that we were able to gather and I just uh, talked with a, a lot of law enforcement officers, there's a risk to the people in the home and, and to the officers. So I think what we came up with uh, was a consensus of how to keep everybody safe. But we did leave that small piece in what says uh, severely restrict. So in those emergency situations, it, there is still that option for a no-knock warrant, but it has to be an absolute emergency. And I, th I think that uh, police agencies have, uh, across the country will find that it will help save lives and uh, also financially, uh, you know, you spend a lot of money on no-knock warrants. Thank you. Ms. McCoyham, as someone who represents the community perspective, how does the recommendation to ban no-knock and quick-knock warrants resonate with you? Well, first of all, <laughs> I remember when we had the discussion, I said, I guarantee you that if you dig deep into history, that this type of entry is connected to Jim Crow. Um, and I, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm feel strongly about that. And there was also some research, research done by the task force that showed that, um, you know, most of these type of um, entries have taken place in the homes of African Americans. And so I just feel like it's a shift taking place right now. And again, these are, these are no brainers. Like anybody, me sitting in here right now and somebody just knocks on the door and comes in. I mean, that, that can cause all types of problems. We've seen it with the Brianna Taylor case. And so mm -hmm. again, basic human, you know, just being common sense, basic core values okay. here. Yeah. And, and there's not really very good research out there, but there was a pretty extensive New York Times study that looked at the number of injuries and death to residents and officers um, following SWAT types of um, uh, searches. And um, it, the ones that involved uh, unannounced forcible entry, entry had more deaths of officers, almost twice as many as those that did not. Um, but even the ones that, that did, where they did knock, there were deaths <laughs> of both officers and residents. So um, that's why the task force felt like, you know, whatever the benefits are, it's not worth it. Um, except in the case of like, if there's a life and death hostage situation, you know, something really egregious, you know, welfare of a child, um, there, there are some very, very special cases where that might um, be necessary. Um, we also know that uh, getting back to the, there's not enough data, uh, Mr. McKesson, you're like the king of what data is out there and what should be out there. I'm wondering if you could share more why the task force recommended that all agencies should routinely publish warrant requests, warrant service activities, and the outcomes of those activities. Yeah, so to zoom out, to echo both what has been said, and also to add this idea that most people think that banning non-knock warrants is like the thing. They're like, we ban non-knock warrants, we stop it. And, and again, what we know is that the police actually don't need a non-knock warrant to do a non-knock raid. They can do a non-knock raid with the host of tools. A non-knock warrant is perhaps one of the most straightforward, but certainly not the easiest and certainly not the only. So getting rid of quick knocks would actually get us closer to actually getting rid of no knock raids themselves. And all the data we have shows that the majority of them happen for drugs anyway. I think that, you know, when we think about making this data public, what we hear sometimes is like this idea that every no knock raid is for, you know, some kidnapping hostage situation in the middle of the night around the drug cartel. And that's just not it. When we look at even the data that comes from cities, it is drugs. Like that is... And it's not, it's like low level amounts of drugs. It's like $300 in Kentucky. It is seizing people's cars. Like this is actually what's happening. And there's no reason why cities should be in the business of rescuing drugs. Like from a public safety perspective, you know, I'm okay with you flushing the drugs down the toilet. That means less drugs on the street, right? I'm not breaking down your door to stop you from flushing something down the toilet, especially not drugs. So like, how do we actually just codify this? I, I worry that there are a couple of states that have banned, that banned no knocks, no knock warrants a couple of years ago and people thought that was like the thing. And it's like, that's not the thing. That like, unless we do the quick knock too, then like we haven't really moved. The reason the data should be public is that 
when the data is public, we can all hold cities accountable. We can say, okay, what happened, what didn't happen? And it's one of the tricky things what cities will do is that they'll say things like, oh, we've only had three non occurrence And it's like, yeah, but the question is how many places have you actually broken into people's houses, right? It's like, forget the warrant, like regardless of the warrant type, how many mm-hmm. places did you actually like right, break right. in? And that's what we wanna know. Yeah, and right. I, and go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, from my personal experience, though, uh, on no not warrants, and this is just my agencies, um, uh, we typically will use SWAT, and, and it's, you know, not a, a no knock warrant shouldn't be served by plain clothes uh, detectives. If you're going to do something like that, and it is an emergency situation or a life is being threatened, or there could possibly be uh, lives taken. Uh, people need to be in uniforms. They need to be identifiable. Uh, you need to know that those are police out there. Uh, and in my agency, the, the no-knock warrants that, that we have served, uh, you're right, uh, DeRay, that a lot of them are drugs, but they also have firearms with them. And that's where that risk assessment comes into play. Uh, but yeah, I agree. They are super dangerous for everybody. Thank you. So um, as you all know, we started our work as a task force, not by looking at any specific policy, but to establish as a collective these underlying foundational principles. And um, your reasoning as a task force was that it doesn't matter what individual policy an agency adopts or a jurisdiction mandates, if you don't address these underlying foundational factors, it's probably not gonna work. Um, Now there's eight of these principles in total. Um, I invite viewers to go and explore those as part of the full report. But I'm gonna lift up um, a few of them today and then ask each of you to uh, address one of them. So one is to make sure that uh, recruits possess the skills and the personality traits that enable them to interact with the public respectfully and empathetically. Um, Another is to build trust uh, with the community through greater accountability mechanisms and more transparency. And the third is to co-produce safety, for police to collaborate with residents to develop community safety solutions that fit their safety needs and fit the solutions that they think are best. So I'm hoping that in this last uh, bit of time, we can um, discuss each one of those and then we'll turn it over to Q&A from the audience. Um, So uh, Mr. McKesson, would you mind taking the first one? Oh, no, no, I'm not gonna give you the first one. I'm gonna give you the one on accountability and transparency. Can you share a little bit more about why the task force felt like that was an important foundational principle and ways to um, operationalize that? Yeah, so, so remembering that the definition of accountability is how close are you to what you said you were gonna do? And that's like what accountability means at the end of the day. So if you think about any public servant, it's like, have we said the rules are this? Have we said the standards are this? How close are you to that? The only way for us to know how close you are is for us to have the data. So like when we think about accountability and transparency, they necessarily are aligned. So if we say you can't shoot people, if we say you can't choke old people, if we say like we need to figure out how close you were to those standards. And if you are far from them, there's a consequence. If you're close to them, then okay. But the only way for us to know that is if there is actually the data is public. So it's not the department regulating itself. It is community. It is politicians being able to look in and say yes or no. Very good. Okay, let's take um, the principle around um, recruiting for the job, tra- recruiting and training for the job. Um, Sheriff, would you want to take on that principle? Sure, uh, I felt like that was a great principle because uh, that's where it starts with uh, the hiring of police and how you do that is very critical and important. Uh, and you know, we need to select people who can work within our communities and serve our communities well. They have to have some compassion and empathy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, diversity is super important. And we're finding out that those agencies that are bringing diverse people in 
are uh, more successful in serving uh, their diverse communities. When we're hiring new recruits, we have to ensure that they have the proper training, but before they're even hired, we have to do excellent backgrounds. We have to go deep into those backgrounds. We have to look into uh, you know, what their beliefs are because if you're hiring officers who have certain beliefs, uh, that could uh, have a huge impact on a police department. And you also have to track uh, what officers are are being fired or disciplined and what they are being disciplined for. So that will tell you what you want to avoid when you are hiring. And, you know, uh, personality traits are important as well. Mm -hmm. Strikes me that it's, it's challenging when I know that at least some agencies are facing a lot of vacancies and, and we're asking them to be choosier. Um, but it seems like I'm hearing that we better to have fewer officers who are the right ones. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Right. What, what I say is we cannot lower the standard. Uh, even if we're short on officers, you can pay overtime, but do not lower the standard because that can impact your entire agency if you hire the wrong person. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McCoy Ham, how about co-producing community safety? Can you share a little bit about why the task force wanted to lift up that as a foundational principle? Sure. Um, collaborating and listening is an important part of building community trust across the board. So I felt like um, understanding the need to collaborate with community to bring the voices of the directly impacted folks into those spaces, which falls into our um, CSSJ shared safety framework um, is a powerful way to shift culture from the inside out or the outside in, depending on your perspective. Um, and just giving the opportunity in, do, in doing that, you give each other the opportunity to go back to that one community and being human and seeing the human side um, of folks and um, dismantling that narrative of us and them, which is what has contributed to all of the drama, all of the trauma, all of the loss. Um, and so I feel like that has to be one of the most important um, recommendations is allowing folks to come to a table um, and to have a conversation from the inception um, of some of these policies and ideas on how we can make our community safer. Thank you for that. We're gonna roll into questions from the audience. We have several. Um, one is a, a real interesting one, um, probably gonna uh, invite um, you, Sheriff, to answer it first. It's what is the role of forced entries to ex execute arrest warrants as opposed to search warrants? So the difference is arresting a human who's, who's inside a residence. Um, the task force recommendation is that there are no forced entries or should not be when the house is occupied. That makes sense for search warrants, but what about for arrests? What should police be doing differently? Well, uh, that's where we talk about that risk assessment again. Uh, we really need to ensure that uh, we're doing everything, uh, you know, e evaluating all the information because if some of the information is lacking uh, from the start of the time the judge signs that warrant, from the start of the time the detective writes a warrant, a supervisor reviews that warrant, all of that is super important. Even on a, a person that has an a, an arrest warrant or they've committed a crime, they ran into a home and now you're uh, forcing your way in to capture them, you have to take those risks uh, and and evaluate them. It, it, it's not a safe thing to do. Many of the individuals that, that are fleeing from uh, law enforcement, there's a reason that they're fleeing and we need to know why. Uh, are they armed? Are they scared? Uh, what is the deal? But you need more information. Sometimes in an emergency situation, you don't have the information. Uh, all you have is maybe a dispatcher telling you some information of what's occurring. And, you know, that's going to happen. But we're public safety. Our first role is to keep everyone safe. Mm -hmm. So it occurs to me that um, if you're looking to arrest someone, uh, unless they're 
in a hideout where they never leave, there's probably other opportunities to apprehend them that doesn't involve forcible entry unannounced when you don't know who else is in the premise. Is that like speaking from just a, a lay person's perspective, is, is that an accurate statement? That is an accurate statement and that uh, occurs all the time. Uh, police agencies you know, across the state of Utah uh, have task forces that, that work on individuals who have warrants and they need to be arrested. But yeah, there are ways to do it. And, and it isn't entering a home and, and um, you know, uh, by force. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. We've got a, a couple of different questions pertaining to chokeholds and training. I think there's some, um, I don't know, question or confusion on the part of audience members about whether the task force is recommending that officers be trained on chokeholds and vascular and carotid restraints or not. So I'd welcome any of you to answer that. I think we all know the answer, <laughs> um, but if you could share more. I, I think maybe the audience may have got, um, you know, uh, some questions when I, I mentioned the training of the chokeholds. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we need to train officers on chokeholds. I think what we our findings were to ban them all together. It wasn't safe. And part of the reason was because uh, people weren't trained on it. Anyone else want to add to that? That's it. Uh, she said it. I, I'm going to introduce a new wrinkle here. I'm going to air some I don't call it dirty laundry, but another part of the lively debate on the part of the task force is this question of deadly force, right? So, so there's this thing in law enforcement where if you're an officer and you're fighting for your life or fighting to protect the life of an innocent member of the public, you can lawfully resort to any means necessary to protect those lives. That could include picking up this glass and you know, throwing it at someone. It could include fists. It could include compression on the neck. And that was a hard one for the task force to wrestle with collectively because they're like, well, if, then, if that can happen then, then how are we banning it? Um, I'm just gonna invite you all to kind of discuss that. You can share a little bit about how we came to consensus on that as a group. I was on mute. So I think that there's still a lot of work to be done around like what, like how do you define deadly force around the country? Um, you know, there's some policies that are really permissive, right? That say things like if you, if you committed a felony with a deadly weapon and you're like, well, that could be, that could mean that I could have robbed a bank with a weapon, put the weapon down and then walked outside and the policy would let the police kill you. And you're like, that doesn't make sense, right? So, so I think about, uh, you know, removing chokeholds is, I think, low-hanging fruit. It's easy. It makes sense. And I don't know, there's no data that shows that these instances where, like, the police are about to be killed, uh, that, that, that that is, like, some overwhelming thing, that that happens all the time. You know, a lot of the cases that we deal with around police violence where the, the result in death, like, the majority are not for violent crimes, right? It's, like, almost 100 are for mental health issues, uh, less than 100 are around traffic stop, right? It's not these cases where like, it's some epic bank robbery that you see on you know, TV or in a movie. That's not what's happening. Anyone else want to weigh in? Sheriff, deadly force. Uh, or, right. oh. I agree with uh, DeRay. There's very few cases of where you're going to find the, you know, an officer is fighting for their life and they're going to use a chokehold. Um, but, uh, you know, there are officers who are trained in jiu-jitsu and they have been trained on chokeholds and, and there's a potential they'll use it. They'll re refer back to their training. But uh, for across the board, uh, you know, they're banned. And as far as deadly force, yeah, across the country, uh, not everybody, uh, has the same policies in place for deadly por force, it does need to be clearer. Uh, and, it, you know, there are situations where we have seen that deadly force was used and maybe there could have been another option, especially with the mental health uh, issues uh, that 
across the country we're dealing with right now. And we have to find alternatives for that the, in responding to that. Thank you. Ms. McCoy? I feel like there's too much gray area um, mm -hmm. in what justifies use of uh, deadly force. And I feel like we have to be realistic and we have to be honest and transparent um, and come up with some more well-defined guidelines on when that is appropriate, number one. And then I feel like we need to pivot and spend a little bit more time, a whole lot of more time on de-escalation and understanding how to recognize um, trauma you know, mental health issues um, and things of that nature. Because when you look at the data, like you, like you said earlier, a lot of it, it goes back to mental health issues. And um, to me, and I always say this, I'm, I've watched so many videos. I've had to sit and watch the video of my own cousin, Antoine Paris. And I thought to myself, as a, as a black woman, I can see many ways this could have been avoided. And so I just, I feel like, Again, it's like going, finding our way back um, and really um, focusing more on de-escalation, like a whole pivot, um, because use of force can't be the cure-all for every um, adverse experience or situation that takes place. Well, I thought my life was in danger. We can no longer in 2021 um, allow all that gray area um, to contribute to the repetitive cycles of trauma that we're experiencing between police and community. Mm -hmm. Well put. Uh, there was a follow-up question on this that's um, I think important to address. They, they wanted a clarification essentially. We know that um, police shouldn't be trained in um, using choke holds or carotid holds uh, anymore if we're recommending the prohibition of them. Um, but do they, does that mean that officers have to be retrained to not use them? So yeah, uh, officers will have to be trained because if you don't pa pass that message around to your officers, mm -hmm. they are gonna revert back to what they received training on when they went into the academy, what they uh, did early in their careers. So you have to train them and explain to them that it's, it's banned and there will be uh, people held accountable uh, if they do use them. Uh, without that, uh, they will just refer back to it and then you know, here we are again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I had a question around, it's kind of related to the training topic we spoke about earlier, and that is you know, some people believe that, you know, getting a higher degree can really make a difference, that education of officers can um, really uh, improve their the compliance with uh, the training and the policies and the way they interact with the community. What do folks think about that? I see a no from Ms. McCoy Ham. Yeah, and let us know it. I feel like, no, it's accountability. Accountability is what is going to um, get us to the other side. It's not the education. Yeah. We, yeah, yeah, like, I mean, there needs to be more, I mean, um, of course you can always, when I was a teacher, we always had to fine tune our skills and, you know, be in compliance um, with the state. Um, but what made me a good, good teacher was accountability because I knew licensing certain things that I had to do, I had to be accountable to. Um, mm -hmm. And I had to be accountable to my parents and to the rest of the staff and also good integrity. So, I mean, that's my two cents. <laughs> Any others? Yeah, I don't think a degree is going to change it. Uh, it does help when you're in those leadership positions uh, to have a degree to help, uh, you know, uh, with policies, procedures, things like that. But it comes from within and you're either got it or you don't. And I don't think any type of college is going to help you get there. Um, we just need to be better at selecting individuals that are going to do public service. That's very helpful. We haven't dug into the literature on that one, but we're eager to do so. Um, from what I know, I, I think it's a mixed bag, which suggests that your, your field wisdom is spot on 
Uh, Mr. McKesson, do you have anything to add to that? No, I'm sure no degrees is probably not helpful, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure that degrees means better outcomes, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that in leadership roles, I'm sure no degrees, yeah, but I don't, I think that, again, if you're in a job where it was hard to get fired and it was almost impossible to get charged with a crime, you know, we could put 10,000 degrees and I'm not sure that would matter, so. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Nancy, uh, I guess I'll, I'll comment a little bit on a, uh, on my myself. So, you know, I was a young teenage mom. Uh, I didn't finish high school. I got a GED. I was hired by, with the GED. It took me several years in law enforcement to pay for my college degree. And I feel like it's the way that I was raised that put me where I am today. And it did not have to do with the schooling, but the schooling has helped me become a better leader. But, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, you either have that within you. Uh, and I don't think uh, just a college degree, requesting a college degree to hire law enforcement uh, is, is going to help. It, it may because they need to read and write. They need to know how to write a report. They need to know how to look at evidence. All of that is very, very important, but it matters who they are within. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question in the audience um, references um, what the task force uh, resolved around um, the importance of recognizing officers that intervene. What does that look like? Recogn oh. Recognition. So, you know, the literature says that uh, officers will follow suit when they see that officers that do the right thing are held up as examples and recognized for doing the right thing. So I think they just want a little bit more um, detail on, on how that might, how those uh, examples might be lifted up. So that would look is, you know, a chief of police or a sheriff uh, would comment on, I appreciate the fact that you came forward uh, versus not commenting, not saying anything, letting them know that it, it's a, a, a good way to, uh, communicate with the leaders, but they have to feel comfortable in order for it to, to work. Um, but I don't know any officer who is gonna be, really want to get recognized in an official manner of saying, oh, you did a great job, you came forward. It really has to be just from the leadership saying, this is okay for you to do. Very good. Um, okay. I think we have time for one last question. Um, and this is the, you know, there's, there's always some cynics in the crowd. Um, these types of report, reforms seem like kind of the obvious things that are already happening. Why is this task force taking on these obvious things? And, and doesn't this amount to tinkering around the edges? Um, why won't the task force tackle the bigger issues or will they? around things like culture and even abolition and defund and all of that. So anyone wanna tackle that? Yeah, I think I'm always interested in this question because I, in so many ways, I think this is actually a police talking point that the police are the people, or like when we rolled out can rate around, um, around use of force policies, police departments all across the country were like, we already do it. And we were like, you don't, which is why we <laughs> pushing you, you know, like they were like, we, they were like, we don't train on chokeholds. And we're like, yeah, but not training on chokeholds is not the same thing as banning them. Right. Or they're like, we train on de-escalation. You're like, yeah, training on de-escalation is not the same thing as requiring de-escalation. Or they're like, you know, if people, if people, you know, turning people who, if they stop other officers who use excessive force, that's a good thing. You're like, yeah, but the policy doesn't require that, right? So I think that there's like this myth that like these things are already happening and they're not. Like, that's like the mm -hmm. first thing is that like, they're not happening. We're not asking people to do stuff that's happening. And I say this as somebody who we led a big campaign around this across the country. It's the biggest campaign ever. And yet there are 18,000 police departments, right? We've done a huge chunk of it, but there's like way more to go. So that's like the first the second thing is that when we think about abolition or we think about a move away from police as the key to public safety, I'm mindful that there's a path to do that, right? That like we can't, we won't just wake up tomorrow and, and it happens and there's no one strategy to get us there. So this is always a both and. It is like, it is like move some money and resources. It is, you know, change these policies. It is tighten up accountability. Like 
no one strategy gets us to zero. And, I, and I, that's not a concession, that's sort of an acknowledgement. In the same way that the end of solitary confinement is not the end of incarceration, it's not. Is the end of solitary confinement a good thing? Yes, right? And that's how I think about this. Thank you. I, I'm gonna give you the last word or perhaps me the last word by thanking um, the three of you, uh, our distinguished panelists for joining us today and uh, lifting up the collective recommendations of you and your colleagues on the task force. I think that there's really something to be said for the consensus recommendations that come out of a collective that is so tremendously diverse in terms of your backgrounds and experiences and, um, and really worldviews and that, um, that you really dug into the research and the facts and the data and that you lifted up these recommendations in new ways. So uh, Ms. McCoy Ham, you have said throughout this, it's a no brainer. And, and it's true, all three of these recommendations are no brainers, but they're also the way you all have put flesh on the bones to help make them more impactful, to help identify the nuance, to help identify the underlying um, foundations that need to be in place in order for those policies to really make a difference. I think that's super powerful. And I, I would hope that um, this, these kinds of recommendations um, lifted up by people like you um, will really uh, make a difference and make a loud cry in city halls and state capitals throughout the country. So thank you so much for that. Um, I welcome all of you in the audience to dig into the details of these three briefs and the foundational principles. And you can do that by going to policing.counciloncj.org. And looking ahead, um, the next topics that we'll be releasing are around various types of training, de-escalation, procedural justice, implicit bias, CIT. We also have body-worn cameras queued up. So stay tuned for those reports in the coming month or so. And um, at, the, at the conclusion of this event, I just wanna thank the army of staff behind the scenes who have contributed so much, so much of their time, their energy, their talent, their expertise to supporting the task force, to bringing their recommendations to life through these beautiful publications and for supporting this web event today. So thanks to you all. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>